Um, let's just open up in a word of prayer. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity today to come and you know and just share this share this study that I that just touched me the way you know that I needed it to touch me at the time. Uh, I thank you for putting your thoughts in my you know in, in my mind last night you know to change some things around and, and to give this study the, the time that it actually deserves. Let this study today you know reach out to the people that are here to listen to it, the people that are online, and uh, you know I just hope that it just it just talks to everyone that gets an opportunity to hear it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. amen. <clears throat> so again, this is session three. Um, I started this uh, series a few months ago. And, uh, you know, the, the main title was Don't Give the Enemy uh, a Seat at Your Table. Uh, as I was preparing for today, I was actually completely set on finishing it. Uh, you know, it was, this part was normally six, six sessions. Uh, I was going to try to shove everything into one. Uh, and it just, as I read over it last night at 10 o'clock at night, I just wasn't happy with the way it was. So I kind of like shredded my papers and I, I, I redid it all over again. So... There will be one final one after this, um, but you know today's message. I think out of all of them, and the reason why I changed it because I pretty much am convinced that it's the most powerful part of this series, and it required more time uh, for me to complete God's message, you know, and what I learned and why I wanted to share it with you. So, good news for everybody who loves to hear me talk that there will be one more, you know. Um, so. Uh, and I'm also excited because I truly believe that today's message has the power to completely change the direction of your life. Uh, you know, uh, we're talking today in part three, and the title for today is Winning the Battle of Your Mind. Okay, just to get a quick recap, I don't know if everybody was here for part one or part two, um, but the series started off with us discussing, um, you know, God setting a table before us and the enemy always trying to stick his fingers in there. Uh, you know, we learned... Nine powerful words, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. On a daily basis, we go through so many different things that just allow, you know, one little thought, one little process to come in and separate us. Um, you know, that God prepared a table for us. He prepares us for the events in our lives and those situations that we have no control over. I had talked about, if you guys, well, some of you will remember the, the incident I had with someone who cut me off. And I kind of like went a little crazy for about 12 to 13 minutes until God reeled me back in, uh, you know. And we also learned in Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6, when, you know, uh, we learned that the Lord is my shepherd, you know, uh, he lies me down in pastures. I'm not going to go through it if you guys have an opportunity to see it. Part 1 and Part 2 are actually online, and um, I encourage you to take a look. Um, because God will always walk me through those valleys. His goodness and mercy will follow me wherever I go. The second session, we learned about the tactics of the enemy. We identified how to know when the enemy is at your table. Uh, again, this is just a quick recap. Uh, you know, we learned the four major tactics that the enemy uses. You know, uh, should we sit at another table? Is it always easier? Uh, is it always easier just to say, hey, you know what, uh, I'm having problems in my marriage, I'm not happy with my relationship, uh, I don't like where I work. Whatever the circumstances were, the grass always sometimes seems to be a little bit greener. Um, the second tactic was always having these thoughts in our heads about, you know, you're not going to make it. Um, I kind of went into a whole parody about, not parody, but uh, about how God reminded us in Psalms 1 through 6, you know, as we learned about being the shepherd and everything, that Jesus didn't walk David to the valley of death. He walked him through it. Okay, so that's God's promise, you know, letting us know that no matter what we're ever going to go through. Um, you know, God didn't tell or build a bridge for Moses to cross the Red Sea when we were trying to get out of Egypt. You know, he parted the sea and he helped Moses lead the people through it. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, third tactic, you know, is you're never good enough. You know, those thoughts that are constantly coming into your head. You know, no matter what I do, I'm not good enough. And four, you start to believe that everyone is against you. Again, just a quick summary for people that weren't here. Uh, you know, we didn't want to go through life with closed fists and putting up walls when Jesus spent, you know, Jesus came to, you know, to break those walls and he, he, didn't, he didn't approach us with closed fists. He actually approached us with open hands. Okay, so that was just a recap. So today's study, 
Today's study, I want to discuss the title, which is Winning the Battle of Your Mind. Um, and I'm going to try to do this the best I can through the power of God's Word. And as Pastor always teaches us, I'm going to open up with a scripture. Uh, you know, because our minds and what we go through every day is the most powerful thing that God ever gave us, besides the gift of what he did when he came down. But in Proverbs 23, 7, this is in the NIV, because this is what was on the, 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 the teaching session, but, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what does that mean? You know, what happens in the battlefield of our mind uh, ends up translating into our lives and starts to write a story of who we actually are. So, you know, what we believe, what we see, what we go through, it all changes us throughout the course of our lives. You know, I mean, I, I go through personal issues. I mean, I've, I've lost a son. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's a fact of life. You know, we don't live in a world, you know, 10,000 years ago. Uh, but what's really important to take away from the study today is that you have the power to change your mind. No one controls it but you. Okay? Um, you might not be able to change the circumstances in your life. You might not be able to change certain people that, you know, are not helping you in your life. Okay? Um, there's a lot of events that happen. There's a lot of hardships. There's a lot of sickness. Uh, you know, but when you don't have control over it, you can pray about it. You can believe in God's word, um, but today's session is going to show you how, you know, why we need to change the power in our mind. You know, when we adapt the thoughts of changing our mind, you know, you could be like me where, you know, I grow up and I say to myself, you know what, I didn't do anything wrong. Someone else did it. They're to blame for my problems, so I should just be angry and walk through life, okay? Um, why don't people look at me differently? You know, I'm a great guy. Good looking, got a good job, drive a nice Jeep. Um, you know, I've done nothing wrong. But the reality is that I needed to wake up and everybody needs to wake up to the power of the truth and with God's word, we can do that. Um, we can change our thoughts because when our thoughts change, then our actions are going to change. And when our actions change, the path of our life is going to change. And when the path of our life changes, life changes altogether. So it's about you taking control through God's power and winning the battle of your mind. I was trying to think of a good example to try to make this a metaphor, because I'm usually good with my own personal stories, but um, Luke Giglio, who actually did this study, came up with a really great one. It talks about like when you're going through life and it's almost like a football game. The first study that I did was God's game plan, and I actually used that for football, so it was kind of ironic. Um, but when you're going through a game and you're getting your butts kicked, okay, and you're not playing right and everything is going wrong and you've been intercepted 10 million times, once you go through the first and second quarter, there's a halftime. And what people don't usually see is when they're sitting at home or they're in the stands is what happens to those teams when they go and they separate and they, go, they get into their locker rooms, that there are a series of people where you walk in and the offense is going over to one side, the defense is going over to the other side, you have your offense's coordinators, your coaches, they, you know, there are seats there for every player. They're not in there just saying, okay, i got to take a 15-minute break. There are people that have been up in, this, up in the, um, the booth analyzing everything that they've done wrong, and then you have the coaches that come in and they say, okay, we're, uh, we're only halfway done with this game and we can still win it. Okay, but this is what we didn't do. When the offense had this kind of setup, you know, we didn't set up this way. So if it ever happens again, we're going to sit there and do it this way. And the same thing goes for the defense, you know. Um, the adjustments have to be precise, and so do the adjustments in the life, you know, for us. They have slides, you know, the X's and O's that we all grew up seeing, okay? But, you know, when they come out of that room, they're all like now, oh, they got that new recharge, and it's almost like coming to church where saying, like, hey, you know what, I heard a message, it spoke to me, and I'm all ready to go, and then all of a sudden, if I don't follow through with what all those people did, we have the best coach that's ever been in existence, and it's just a matter of, you know what, I don't need five different people, I just need to listen to the one. Okay, so, you know, we have time to make those adjustments in our life. And now, if you're going to be able to join the story of don't give an enemy a seat at your table, you know, you're going to have to change your mind. You're going to have to, you know, reapproach the way that you think of things, okay, because it's not as simple as, like, when I went through the table here and it was great, you know, God invites us to sit down, but you can't just say, okay, you know what, I'm going to just shove the enemy away, 
because he's always going to come back. He's always going to find that one little crack. You can't just kick a chair out from anybody because that wouldn't be the Christian way to do it. You know, Christian life is I'm going to think right. I'm going to believe right until I walk with what I know is right. And that's where you'll win the battle. So just like we did with the tactics of the enemy, you know, he summarizes this in four different ways um, that we can sit there and win the battle in our minds. Um, the first is when a thought enters your mind, you have to do one of you have to you have to identify and restrict the access to that thought. Okay, it's like driving on a freeway. You know, I mean, like you know, and I can tell you, you know, I've been driving on the Jersey Turnpike a lot this week, and my truck doesn't do well over 65 miles an hour. It kind of shakes and rattles all over the place. That's one of the reasons why I was on the Jersey Turnpike three times, um, looking for a new vehicle. But, uh, you know, now we got easy pass. But when I got off of one exit, and this is what kind of like, this wasn't in the study, but one exit was, you know, there was actually an old-fashioned toll booth where I actually had to stop and there was a gate, you know, and it kind of made me think of the fact that, like, you know what, we spend all this time in our lives, you know, like with all these thoughts rushing through our heads, you know, every time something happens to us, you know, how great would it be if we actually had control of our thought process by maybe setting up a toll booth in our minds, okay? Um... Something to slow us down, you know, something that could say, hey, you know what, if this is going to happen to me, I'm going to allow what car is going to go through my toll booth. I'm going to allow what thoughts go through and what thoughts aren't going to make a difference in my life. Again, I hope that makes sense, but I was, that's where I was kind of going with that thought process, you know. You know, go back to like the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. You know, God will always confirm his abundance, just like at the table when we learned you know, everything is there. I had everything laid out on the table. It was all my favorite foods. I actually had that set up today. Went to the store last night, spent almost $75 on food. I was going to blast this table with more things than anything else because I really had in every intention on finishing this study. And it's actually all sitting in the car because Karen gets the benefit of all the fruit that I buy from the store because I don't eat healthy like I should. Um... You know, but when God gave the abundance to Adam and Eve, you know, he, you know, it was like him saying, you know, like, okay, listen, this is a garden. Here's the beauty. Here's everything that you're ever going to possibly need. You two are going to run it. Okay. Here's the earth. You two are in charge. Okay. The animal kingdom. I'm going to let you name all the animals. You know, I'm giving you everything. Okay. Um, I'm even going to come down in the cool of the day and I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to talk to you. Okay, and I'm going to grow that relationship because I love you. That was the promise that God gave to Adam and Eve. How perfect was that? You know, sometimes I think if I can go back in time, the genie appeared. You know, it's one of the little pastor's things. I got to have a type. But if a genie appeared and gave me three wishes, I mean, yes, I would want to be Superman. Absolutely. I would want all the powers of Superman. Um, I'd want the little magic eight ball that no matter what I ever asked it, it would give me every answer. Past, present, or future. What are the winning lottery numbers, even though I'm not allowed to play the lottery anymore? Um, but what would Garden of Eden would have been like? You know. Um, but then God says to them, but there's a tree right in the middle. One tree. The tree of the knowledge of good versus evil. And he said, don't mess with that tree. Don't touch it. Don't go anywhere near it. Okay? It'll kill you. Um, and just like in part one and part two, that was the smallest crack that the enemy needed to break through to Adam and Eve. God knew it was going to happen, okay, but there's that one thing that always happens in our lives, okay? He found that crack, a tree. And do you think when the enemy was sitting there slithering along the ground, he was saying to himself, you know, like, oh my God, look at this place. It's beautiful. It's got everything. The freshest water, blah, 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 blah. There's no way. No, he didn't say that. Okay. He saw the crack. So what did he do? He undermined God's heart. Challenged God's word. Okay. And he fed into that thing. We all have. We all have it. In today's world, we call it FOMO. The fear of missing out. Okay, that's what Adam and Eve faced. That's what we face a lot in our lives, the fear that we're going to miss out. So abbreviated FOMO for the millennials that are in the room. Okay, um, 
snake went up, you know, tells Eve. God didn't say, ah, it's not going to happen to you. You're not going to die. This was the snake trying to convince her that no matter what God said, he was undermining his word. Nothing's going to go wrong. That enemy straight up challenged the word of God. Secondly, he challenged the heart of God. God's holding out on you. These are the thoughts that he was placing in her head. Okay? The Bible's not kind of clear that Adam was there at the time. So, I mean, you know, I always say that, you know, every time... I even said it to somebody this morning, like, why is it so cold out? Who said that this morning? Was somebody here? I said, it's all Eve's fault. Okay? <laughs> Woman. From the beginning of time. Okay? <laughs> um... Sorry, I lost my place. Uh, so then secondly, you know, he charged, he, he challenged the heart of God. You know, God's holding out on you. You know, he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to have all the answers that he has. That's why he doesn't want you near that tree. And she fed into it. And again, don't know how she got to Adam, but Adam should have said, eh, go away. Um, God knows if you touch that tree, you're going to know what he knows. He knows that you're going to be just as powerful as him. You know, I believe we're afraid of a lot of things here on planet Earth, but I would put the fear of missing out right on top of that list. I do it myself. You know, I was just mentioning that I was looking, I was car shopping this week. Everybody knows I love my Jeep. Um, I love it to death. Strengthened my relationship with God since the moment I got it, from the moment I found that DVD. But I have this thing now in my head that I can't get it out of. I want a Ford Raptor got to be a Ford Raptor. It doesn't matter. I've looked at every car on the planet, okay? I don't like anything. There's only one car that I like, okay? And this week, I can honestly tell you that, you know what? I have traveled probably over 500 miles to look at three different vehicles, and every single experience was a horror story. <laughs> it was the enemy sitting there saying to me, you know what? You're going to miss out because you didn't go there. You didn't get that car. One car was, ah, I'm going to see it at 11 o'clock in the morning. Oh, it sold before you got there. Karen and I drove to New Jersey last Saturday, three and a half hours in the car, to see two of them at the same dealership, to find out that when we got there, the salesman goes, ah, you just missed them. Even though I was told at 4.30 the night before that, I, that those vehicles were there and that they were being held aside for me to take a look at them. Excuse me. Pastor made reference last Sunday to an earthquake in Jersey. I don't know if you guys all remember that. Okay. I leaned over to Elder Jeff and I said, you know what, that was me. Okay. Karen was outside walking the dog and I'm surprised that she didn't jump in the car and drive away. You know, I have those moments, I'm human. Again, the enemy sat in and I was not kind to those people. I stopped being a Christian for a good 12 minutes. And yes, I am the reason why there was an earthquake in the, the northern part of New Jersey last week. Okay. Um, you know, but even like, you know, and I said, okay, fine. You know, Karen, I'll actually tell you she was very proud of me. Thought about that enemy thing. And you know what? Usually that would have ruined my entire day. She even said to me that night, she goes, you know, I'm really proud of you. She goes, you know, usually you let those thoughts tear you apart. And you know what? I said, you know what? There's nothing I could do about it. And we enjoyed the rest of the day, the long ride home. Four and a half hours. Uh, you know, and then even the other, uh, and then even this week, I decided to take a day off from work because there was the car, black on black, 29,000 miles on a three year old car. This was in the southern part of New Jersey, Camden, Philadelphia area. Okay. I got up at five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock actually, jumped in the car. I still can't believe at 5.45 that there's traffic going past JFK Airport in the morning. Okay. And uh, I did well, though, because I'm at a point now with traffic that I just say, there's 600 people in front of me and behind me that are going through the same thing. Um, but I was praying pretty much the whole time. It's, you know, when Pastor and I go on Jeep trips and so forth, you know, we don't literally have the radio on that much, and we talk. And I drove the entire way down there, which was about two and a half two and three hours, and I just prayed, and I said, you know what, Lord, I don't know what your plan is, I go, and I don't know if I'm doing this wrong, but you know what, just, if this is your will, please let it be done, and I got there early, about a half hour before they even opened, and 
I've been at this place and it wasn't like a car dealership. It was one of these like high end exclusive, you know, Ferraris, Hummer threes and all these different things. And I'm like, can't see inside the window, but I'm going to walk around the back. Cause I got to see, there's, there's gotta be a lot here somewhere. And I turn the corner and there it is the black on black Ford Raptor. And I was expecting the angels to go, ah, <laughs> you know, Esther will tell you when we went to buy the Jeep, you know, we walked in and the car was inside the service department and, you know, I, I had that ah moment, you know, it was the perfect car, it was God's plan for me and I turned the corner and at first I was just like, ooh, this car looks good in black, but the closer I got to it, I wasn't getting that same reaction, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't feeling the same way and I even called him and, and, and I was just like, something's wrong here and then he got closer and it was like, how could a 29,000 mile car have a dent and a scratch on every single body panel? I mean, you know, the description was flawless. And um, drove it, great, powerful car. It was just <clears throat> and um, interior was like brand new, but I couldn't get past the fact that there was going to be about $6,000 worth of body work, and you know how I am with my car. I couldn't do it, and I even texted faster, and I said, I'm going to walk away. And um, that's, you know, that fear of missing out on that one car, even Karen said, well, there's another one in North Jersey. Why don't you see that one before you, because you're going to pass it anyway. And it ended up being at a service station, and it was missing, like, the whole top half of the engine. And it was like, you know, but when you see the pictures, it looks brand new. <laughs> I was like, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore, you know. Um, I circumnavigated God's plans because it was what I wanted. It was what I thought I wanted, okay, and I believed that I was going to miss out on it. And I think a lot of us are guilty for doing the same thing. You know, taking shortcuts, but I do praise God and I'm thankful that, you know, sometimes I don't believe that I have a, a, my closeness with him anymore. Um, the enemy has, has taken a real toll on me recently, and um, I was grateful and, and, and I praise him for talking to me that day and letting me walk away. Yeah. You know, I didn't doubt the goodness of him at that moment, you know, and I didn't want to take a shortcut. Um, that would have been, you know, that was like my toll booth moment. You know, um, that would have been like a great toll booth moment for Eve in the garden. You know, she would have turned around when that snake, you know, because I don't know how many snakes there were around back then, but I mean, like, you know, if you think about being the only man and woman on the planet and you see this thing slithering towards you, you might like, I thought, I'd probably jump out of my, she wasn't wearing any clothes at the time, so she can't jump out of anything. But, um, but Eve had that little toll booth moment. She would have said, hey, who are you? You know, like, why are you here? Well, you know what? I'm just, I'm just a simple little snake. I'm a good snake. I'm just hanging out, taking a look at things. You know, she needed to do what you and I need to do. She needed to examine that thought. You know, and what we do is we let that thought in, and then we dwell on it for a while. Okay, a couple of days go by, thought process go by, texting goes by. Then we call our friends. You know, it's like, hey. I need your opinion. And then that goes on for months. And that same thought is still sticking in your head, like almost like, you know, six months later. You know, before you go, you know, without that toll booth, you know, without us being able to win that battle in our minds to say, you know what, why do I have this thought? Okay, I need to think about it. And, you know, where would we be today? I'm not going to say this in a negative way, but we probably all be sitting here with no clothes on if Eve would have had the toll booth back at the time, you know. Instead, you know, we just need to examine the thoughts, and to examine the thoughts, we just need to ask basically two questions, and it's very, very simple. Where did that thought come from? You know, me with the raptor? Obsession. Don't, can't explain it, okay? Um, I believe that New Jersey needed an earthquake that day, so I decided to take a ride, okay? So where did it come from, and is it congruent to God's word? Okay, those are the only two questions that we need to ask. Like, so let's go back to the table, you know, when we spoke about, you know, like those thoughts and those tactics about you not being good enough. Where did those thoughts come from? Has anybody ever thought that? I'm not good enough to do what I needed to do. I'm not good enough in my job. I'm not good enough in my marriage. I'm not good enough with my friends. You know, I'm always messing things up. Okay. I know it didn't come from our shepherd because the shepherd tells us in Psalm 23 that he's a good shepherd. But we also learn that there's a bad shepherd out there. You know, um, was it congruent with God's word? No. 
you know, God, ta- God teaches us. He loves us. He's going to be there for us. He's going to take care of us. He extends an invitation to the table. And he's not going to let any harm come to us. You know, the second thing we need to do, you know, to win the battle in our minds is you need to speak to that thought. And this is the hardest thing even for a Christian, but we need to think to that thought in Jesus' name. It's a powerful name. Love that song too, by the way. You know, you've got to talk back to those thoughts that are going on in your head and what people are saying to you or what you can't get rid of. You know, I'm not saying that we need to go to war with the enemy because Jesus already did that. Jesus defeated the enemy, okay? The enemy doesn't really know my name. I mean, I'm just one single person to him, okay? He doesn't tremble when he hears Drew. He should, but he doesn't. Um, But he does tremble at the name of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, But you have to be able to talk back to those thoughts in Jesus' name. And that's what... This is uh, oh, this is what Paul tells us in Second Corinthians, uh, ten three verses uh, three through four. I'm going to read it to you. This is in the NIV again uh, because I it was two o'clock in the morning when I rewrote this and uh, I didn't have time to look it up. But for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That's God telling us that right now it's not a battle of of individuals or something. We have the power to destroy strongholds in our minds. We have the power to take our thoughts and put them where God wants them to be. To stop at a toll booth and say, why is this happening to me? What are we doing? Okay, we have the power to bind those thoughts but we need to do it in Jesus' name. So you're either going to bind those thoughts or those thoughts are going to bind you. And I'm guilty of that myself. I'm going to stop playing the blame game. Okay. I'm going to stop saying, you know what, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not perfect, even though I tell people I am. Um, No one's going to control my mind but me. And nobody needs to control their mind but you. Okay? For some of us, it's harder. You know? It's like breathing. You know? We don't consciously think about breathing. You know? It just happens. Okay? But finding it in Jesus' name, okay, is sometimes hard for people to do in front of people. It's hard for, you know, they're always worried about, you know, what people are going to think. But just like breathing, it's something that we, you know, get to a point where, you know, I don't think about breathing. I don't get up in the morning and say, oh, I'm breathing. Okay? You know, it just happens. You know, that's what we do throughout the course of the day. You know, but those thoughts that go through our head, you know, as we sit there and we bind it in Jesus' name constantly, bad thought, okay, you know what? Mm. One of those two things. Why do I have this thought? And is it congruent with with God's word? Nope. I give it to you, Christ. Take it away from me, Jesus. Okay? I give it to you. Take it away from me. Sometimes it works. But like breathing, you know, we're constantly breathing. I might have to say five, six, seven, eight times a day. The same thought pops back in my head over and over again. You know, I'm losing that battle in my mind, and I have to keep saying to myself, you know what, God, take it away. Jesus, take it away. Jesus' name is most powerful. Okay, but then sometimes those days will turn into, all right, maybe that thought won't pop back in for a couple of days, and i got to do it again. And eventually it becomes like breathing. Okay, then maybe a couple of months will go by. And then maybe a year will go by and somebody will say something or bring up a past or bring up something that was took me a year to get rid of, you know, and then I got to do it all over again. But like breathing, it's just going to be something that we do naturally. The third thing we have to do to win the battle in our mind is we need to claim the truth. Okay? This is what Jesus taught us to do, okay? Think about like those 40 days and 40 nights, you know, and, and Jesus was being tempted and the enemy was saying, oh, you know, you turn these rocks into bread, no problem. You know, Jesus didn't have to say, like we do, in Jesus' name, take these thoughts away. He'd say, in my name, I take them away. (laughs) You know, um, man shall not, you know, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. You know, it's kind of like the same when Jesus spoke at the well of Samaria, when he said, you know, my God is to do the will of him who sent me. John 4, verse 34. You know, Jesus didn't have to ask two questions. You know, he was the word. 
okay, he was the thought. Okay? So when your opinion becomes God's words, then you have something to fight with. Okay? And the last thing that we need to do to win this battle in our minds is we need to walk in the truth. Okay? We can't skip the examination of those thoughts. We can't skip the examination of the thoughts that are in your mind. God doesn't sit there and want to complicate freedom, but he doesn't promise us skittles and rainbows. I say that all the time. Okay? It's, life is hard. You know, but God is good. I use that one a lot. Okay? Um... It's not complicating freedom. You know, today's session title is, you know, winning the battle in our minds. You know, you know, there's going to be some fighting involved. You know, it's not, you know, we learn here, you know, through our teachings as Christians that, you know, the closer we become to God, the harder things are going to become. You know, it's going to be a battle. It's not going to be easy. You know, but if we do not change that battle in our minds, then nothing is ever going to change in our lives because those thoughts of whether or not it's missing out on something, like a truck, making me be stupid and drive all those miles, okay? Whether it's, you know, uh, something as simple as having a thought in your head that somebody did wrong to you and say, where did that thought come from? You know, I don't have the scriptures memorized. I, I never will. I mean, there are certain ones that I have that will you know, stick with me wherever I go. Um, but God left us directions, you know. He gave us an invitation at the table. He gave us a description of the tactics the enemy is going to use. And now he's telling us how we're we going to be able to change our lives and how we're going to be able to change everything that happens to us by winning the battle in our minds. First, we're going to identify it. We're going to bind it. And I'm going to learn the word of God that sets me on a new course Okay, um, and then I'm going to walk in that way as a Christian. And that's how, no matter what you have been through in your past, no matter what's going to happen to you in the future, it's the only way that we can win this battle. Every time we come into the church and we hear a, a sermon, it strengthens our word with God, it strengthens our knowledge with God. Um, every time we read the Bible, every time we grow stronger with God's word, it gives us the tools so that we can answer those two questions. You know, why is this happening? And is it congruent to God's word? Okay. Um, and that's how we're going to win the battle in our minds. Um, sometimes I tend to talk fast, and I kind of cut this one a little bit shorter today than I normally would have, but the final part that's going to happen where you're going to see the big spread and we're going to regroup and we're going to get participation for people coming in, um, the title is The Path to Victory, you know, and uh, that one there you're going to see, you know, with screaming colors, you know, how God's path for us is going to be resolute in his invitation for us to come and sit at the table with him. So please take something away from you today that, you know what, we don't have to worry about the fear of missing out. The only thing I would worry about is just the fear of missing out is if I did something to separate myself with Christ or with God himself that when the rapture came, that I was still stuck here. That's my only fear of missing out. That's the only thing I worry about. I get consumed with a lot of the things in this church. I get consumed with a lot of things that go on in my life, and people around me will tell you that my brain does not stop from the minute I get up, and I have a hard time going to sleep at night because I can't shut it off. Mm -hmm. Things dwell in me, okay? And like I said, this study reminds me and changes me, uh, and I hope some part of it today will change you. And I thank you for coming out. So. Let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Dear Lord, uh, you know, sometimes I don't know if my word comes out the right way. Sometimes I'm hopeful that, you know, the things that are in my heart and the way that it is in my brain is the way that it came out. You know, let us just take something away from today that, you know what, we know the invitation is there for you to sit with us. We know that your word teaches us about the enemy. In this church, we're not afraid of the enemy, okay, because we know who he is, we know what he's going to do, and we know, you know, the taxes tactics that he's going to use on us. But today we actually are going to just take away with us one little thing, you know, one simple thing, the most important thing, is you giving us the strength to win that battle in our minds. The world we have right now is not the world I think you wanted it to be, okay? We all go through personal things, we all go through events in our lives, and 
seldomly do I see somebody that's like, you know, so happy that I wish I was them. But give us this opportunity today to understand those two questions about why are these thoughts in my brain and are they congruent to what your, God, what your word is. Teach us today about that toll booth we need to have, you know, that we need to put that gate down and allow what we want in our lives and what we don't want in our lives. And uh, give us the strength today to just take that power within you and become better, come closer to you, uh, and give us the strength to understand the difference that we will win the battle in our minds because you are on our side. You love us, and, you know, you loved us before we were. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.